Thank you, choir. Thank you, thank you. I want to thank you for your prayers for me uh, last week as I went down to Austin with church ambassadors, and uh, it was just a glorious experience. I didn't really know what we were uh, expected to do, but we have, there's three full-time staffers, and they work with us, and we had pastors from uh, Lindale that uh, got to be with, and from Dallas and San Antonio, and um, way down at uh, Laredo, so it was just a, a great time, and we got to meet some wonderful state representatives. I did not realize, I had forgotten, I guess I knew it, but I'd forgotten it, that our uh, state representatives only meet every other year from January through May, and they have other responsibilities, but they just work on laws, are quote, in session, and I know we've all heard about the extended sessions and the special sessions, so they, their uh, January through May is now four months in their month 10. They're exhausted. And I know the contentious bills, they're doing redistricting now, which is once every 10 years, and that's ying, 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 ying. And then the heartbeat bill, and you know the contention that was with that. And so we need to pray for our state reps. And I was blessed to meet Matt Schaefer, uh, our representative, and he's just a great guy. And I was, I was pleasantly surprised at the number of committed Christians. And you can send a little note in, and, uh, you know, and I didn't realize this, you stand in the lobby where the lobbyists stand. I didn't know that. And you, there's a little guy, and you send a note in to Representative Schaefer, and you say, you know, if I'm with, um, you know, pharmaceutical company, I want to talk about drug da 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 bills, such and such. But we just put, we want to thank you for your service and pray for you. We had them coming out here right and left wanting to be prayed for, and uh, uh, they couldn't return that down, especially from, if they're from your district. They'll really come out. But they were so gracious, and we got to pray with uh, Republicans and Democrats, and it just was a, a glorious experience. So uh, our method now shifts when they are finally finished to uh, kind of build friendships on a, uh, a basis with them and uh, just let them know that um, uh, the pastors in their area and the churches care for them and are praying for them. So thank you for your prayer for me. Uh, I turn to the book of Micah and we're continuing our journey coming towards the end of the minor prophets in the book of Micah from page uh, uh, 951. And we're going to look what the Lord requires of us uh, with some other things. And I read this story, and I didn't know that Hank Aaron, one of the home run kings of uh, Major League Baseball and the great uh, catcher and uh, coach, Yogi Berra, played in a World Series together. And Yogi Berra is quite a character, if you know him, and he would stand behind and, and chatter to the batters. And uh, they were in the, the World Series, and he said to Hank, Hank, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to hold it so you can read the trademark. Just trying to obviously get him, but Hank said nothing. First pitch, one swing over the left field, uh, you know, bay, a fence into the grandstands, a home run. And as he crossed the plate, you know, Yogi's standing there kind of dejected. This is the World Series. And he said to him, he said, I didn't come here to read. What? I came here to hit home runs, and I just did. And we look at this, and a question that every young person, every senior adult, everyone in between, men and women, we all ask some questions. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What does God want from me today as we begin a new week? And the book of Micah answers that uh, so clearly. Some people... Uh, these were really sad notes I came across. They're little stories from uh, the great author, Henry Thoreau. He made the statement, this is man that one wonders what it is to live at all. And you go, he, you can just see the despair. Well, you know, like I'm famous, I've got poems, and, but what is it? And I, I've always been a fan of Lee Iacocca. He was the one who uh, was the engineer behind the Mustang, the Ford Mustang back in 1964 and a half, they came out and later went on to lead Chrysler a Company in the restoration of the Statue of Liberty. And, and he wrote, he said, in a little book called Straight Talk, here I am in the twilight of my ear, years, still wondering what it's all about. I can tell you this, fame and fortune is for the birds. And I read, my heart really kind of went out. I go, gosh, all that. And he comes to the twilight, and he's still, why am I here? And one man, it is kind of funny but kind of sad, uh, he was. He wrote. He said. I, he left in his will that after he's cremated, that his ashes be put in an egg timer so that his life wouldn't be a total write-off. I go. 
Okay, yeah, it's too funny to laugh at it, but I did laugh when I read that. Then I go, oh my goodness. And uh, we look at this little tucked away book of Micah, and he's gonna answer that question why we're here, amongst other questions too. And uh, myself, I always get stumped when I'm, someone says, what's your favorite book of the Bible? Like, oh, and I like choosing the favorite hymn and chorus. Like, oh gosh, I gotta pick one. And I used to say, well, I did, uh, you know, name of, here's my top three. But I do have, not just, you know, uh, I do have a favorite verse of, this, of the Bible, and it's Micah 6, 8, and I've chosen that as my life verse. The verse, I go, God, this is, this is what I want my life to look at, because this is what you want. And I encourage you, if you've never had a life verse, uh, pray about that. Read scripture and ask the Lord to give you one. It's just something to kind of anchor yourself on, and it's very special just between you and the Lord. And we look at Micah, and he's what we would call today a country preacher. He came from a little backwards town. Actually, I'd never heard of it until I studied this. It's 20 miles southeast of Jerusalem, called Morasheth. And uh, he's not like Isaiah, who was a great prophet, a priest, and was in the social circles of the upper echelon. He was a very simple man. He was a contemporary of Isaiah, Hosea, Amos. And his book has been called, in reverence, The Little Isaiah, which is quite a compliment because Isaiah is such a great uh, prophetic book, and this book has been uh, quoted, read in the Oval Office, and even read at one of the presidential inaugurations. So it's, it's been a great, a great book. Now, we look at this, and we see all types of, uh, God uses all types. Here's a common man from an unknown country, and he didn't address, many addressed the leaders of the land per se, but he did not. He addressed kind of the common man, which is 99% of God's kingdom, and I'd say I'm one of those. And he wrote 2,600 years ago, but his writings from this country preacher have been in the White House, presidential inaugurations. Uh, we're gonna see if they have affected the UN, the Christmas story, and My Life First. So this is a pretty dynamic book, isn't it? So, especially My Life First, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Now, I want us to start, I really want to, I don't want us to belabor this, but we need a, over, a bird's eye view, and then we'll pick up three sections of scripture. And on your outline, it's divided into three divisions, and they all have a, a common theme, a listen, a rebuke, a judgment, and a blessing. And if you're in chapter one of Micah, we look at the second verse, and here's the listen, attention, that all the people of the world listen. If you want to underline that word listen, it's going to be three times here. Let the earth and everything in it hear. The sovereign Lord is making accusations against you. The Lord is speaking from his holy temple. So Micah is saying God is speaking, and this is what he's going to say. Now, if you move down to the same chapter, the fifth verse, it's a rebuke. And we could put our country in here. And why is this happening? Because of the rebellion of Israel in that day. But we could say, we could put our nation in there because are we kind of a rebellious people against the Lord? And the, the, the second accusation there, yes, the sins of the whole nation. So he said, you've been rebellious and you're, you've sinned and there's judgment. And turn over to chapter 2, verse 3. And this is a judgment, chapter 2, verse 3. But this is what the Lord says, I will reward your evil with evil. In other words, you will reap what you are sowing. You are sowing evil, you will reap evil. You don't, won't be able to pull your neck out of the noose. You will no longer walk around proudly. Is pride a essence of our day? For it will be a terrible time. And then just below this verse in chapter two, verse 13 is the blessing all these are the same. There's listen, a rebuke, a judgment, but God says there's blessing as well. And he's in verse 13 of chapter 2, your leader will break out and lead you out of exile, out through the gates of the enemy city, back to your own land. So it was a promise of restoration. Now the second division here starts in verse 3, and look at chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And it says, the, to listen, I said, listen, there's the second time. Now he says, you leaders, in chapter 1, verse 2, he's speaking to the people, but now he's addressing them through, uh, apparently, letters to the leaders of Israel. This, and this is clergy and politicians here, okay. 
you are supposed to know right from wrong. And you say, well, that should be the case here. But in chapter 3, verse 11, here is the rebuke against these two groups. Chapter 3, verse 11. You rulers made decisions based on bribes. You priests teach God's law only for a price. You prophets won't prophesy unless you are paid. Yet all of you claim to depend on the Lord. No harm can come to us, you say, for the Lord is here among us. In this sad rebuke of clergy, pastors, leaders, and of politicians. And does that kind of sound a little true today at times? And then look, uh, one verse below that in verse 12 is the judgment because of you, speaking to the leaders, Mount Zion will be plowed like an open field. Jerusalem will be reduced to ruins. A thicket will grow on the heights where the temple now stands. And this was a prophecy that was yet to be fulfilled, and it was fulfilled, this verse. Now, God is so gracious, even in their rebellion, he said there is a blessing. And turn over to chapter 5, verse 7, chapter 5, verse 7. And he's just ending. He said, you, you need to listen to me. Here's what I have against you. Judgment will come, but there's a blessing at the end. In verse 7 of chapter 5, and the remnant left in Israel will take their place among the nations. They will be like dew sent by the Lord or like falling rain on the grass, which no one can hold back and no one can restrain. Now, let me ask you a question. If God says something once, should we believe it and follow it? Absolutely. Now, if he says something twice, we probably pay a little bit more attention. Remember, I always loved the, always, the, the King James. Verily, verily, Jesus would say. Now, in, in most modern translations, truly, truly, or listen, listen. In other words, guys, this is important. Listen, verily, verily. This is the second time. Now, if God says something three times, it's like stop, sit down, turn everything off, focus. So now we move to the third section here. Turn to chapter 6, and we'll just see this one more time. And it's the same, we would say same song, third verse. Chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Listen, listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and hills be called to witness your complaints. He said, you know, you're complaining people against me and what I've done. And the rebuke is in verse 3 of chapter 6. And this is a heart-wrenching statement. This is God the Father, Jehovah God, speaking to his people. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? He says, answer me. They were tired of God. He says, oh, no, not God stuff again. And unfortunately, down in verse 14 of this chapter, and this is a picture, I, I read this, and I go, this is a picture of the spiritual discontent in our land, the judgment. You will, in verse 14, you will eat but never have enough. Your hunger pains and emptiness will remain. And though you try to save your money, it will come to nothing in the end. You will save a little, but I will give it to those who conquer you. Ouch. But God said there will be a blessing. And turn over our last one here uh, to chapter 7, <coughs> verse 15. Chapter 7, verse 15. And many times these blessings are just centuries afterwards, but God restored his people, and we see them in their land today. Verse 7, verse, um, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 15. Yes, says the Lord, I will do mighty miracles for you like those I did when I rescued you from the slavery of Egypt. All the nations of the world will stand amazed at what the Lord will do for you. They will be embarrassed at their feeble power that will cover their mouths in silent awe, deaf to everything around them. And so God has spoken through this book, this big thing, that you need to listen to me. This is my complaint, the, the rebuke against you, and the judgment, and then the uh, promise of blessing came. Now, if you'd like to follow in your outline, we're going to camp here in three verses. The first one is a past prop prophecy from our perspective, and turn to chapter 5, verse 2 of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, and you go, oh my goodness, I've heard this verse many times. Okay, I'm glad. <laughs> you can hear it one more time. Uh, Micah 5.2, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. Now, what kind of season does that remind you of? The Christmas season, huh? And you, you've heard that. Usually it's the quote we're going to uh, reference in the New Testament. But the, the context where this came into the New Testament is the, the rulers, the wise men from the east, and we say the three kings. Let me tell you, it never says how many were, there were. Uh, personally, I think this is probably a group of about 200 people. These were the kingmakers of the Persian Empire. They traveled like the president traveled. They had security, they had servants, they had protection. And so when they came to Jerusalem, it says, and everyone was aware of their presence. It wasn't just three guys snuck in at night and had a conversation. Everyone knew they were there. And they asked King Herod, who bought and bribed his way and was not Jewish, into this position. He, he was asked by the wise men, where is he who is born, slap in the face, king of the Jews, because you bought your way there and you bribed your way, and that we may go and worship him. And the, and the Herodian family was a group, they needed lots of group counseling, I'll tell you, because they were killing each other, or just say power, it just sounds like politics today in a, a, a greater scale. And so uh, Herod went and got the scribes and Pharisees and said, where's this Messiah supposed to be? And without a moment's hesitation, look on your outline, they quoted to him, in Matthew 2, verse 5, in Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And they, they quoted his verse. What prophet? Micah. This, this was like, who's the first president of the United States? I mean, everyone knew that answer, except Herod. And so he told them, and they quoted to him Micah 5, verse 2. And we know the most famous city in uh, Israel today is Jerusalem, and now it's you know, recognized as the capital. But the second most is that of Bethlehem, and it's the place where Jesus was born. And amazingly, Bethlehem means house of bread. And what did Jesus refer to himself? I am the bread of life. And from that little obscure village, and I, you know, I, I remember preaching this one time just about Bethlehem and Christmas, and I said, it's like being born in Teaselville. Not a big place, is it? If you're from Teaselville, it's okay. I love Teaselville. But it's just, no one knows about that. But they knew that a, a great ruler, the ruler, would come from Bethlehem. And so Micah stands out as God gave him that, that picture of where Jesus would be born. And so one wise man made the statement. He said Jesus wasn't born in Rome because he'd be associated with the military. He wasn't born in Athens because he'd be associated with with philosophy, and he was born in Bethlehem because he was associated with the bread of life. And truly, truly, he was that. And then note that <clears throat> we see that, yet a ruler whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. And here's that promise, and only Jesus, only deity could fulfill that promise. Now, I encourage you to go um, back one chapter to chapter four, and this is a future prophecy, a future prophecy in chapter four of Micah, verse three. And let me just tell you the timetable of where this prophecy will be fulfilled. The, the fulfillment of, of Micah 5, two was 700 years that took place at Christmas time. Th this now is yet future. And if we look at our prophetic calendar, the rapture of the church is next, when all believers will be taken from this world, which will begin the seven-year great tribulation, which will end with Armageddon and the coming of Jesus, the second coming. At the second coming, Jesus will set up his rule in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. And we get to rule with him. Can you believe that? If you want some encouragement today, uh, hang your hat on that. But when, the, when he comes, this verse will take place. This verse. Micah 4, verse 3, the Lord will mediate between people and will settle disputes among strong nations far away. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. And we put as our cross-reference almost the exact same words spoken by Isaiah. Now, they were not plagiarizing one another. This was so important, God gave it to two prophets. 
because the, our world has always needed this, this encouragement. And Isaiah 4, 2, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Now, this verse, uh, Nathan, picture, has marked the United Nations. Uh, it's interesting, they give the words, but they're very uh, hesitant to give the reference where these words came from. And uh, kind of a pretty, pretty cool picture because that man has his sword and he's beating it into a plow. Now, I know there's many great people in the United Nations, but are they gonna, are they gonna bring this about? No. Oh goodness, they fail time and time and time again. It's only gonna get worse because men cannot bring lasting peace. And thank you, Nathan. And um, uh, this will only be accomplished when Jesus returns. But the important point is, Micah's words are there on the outside and the grounds of the United Nations, which is amazing. Now, next, we're going to end with this. And this is my life verse, and uh, just turn to Micah 6, 8. This is about personal relationships. And I want to read the, the two verses previous to that because it sets the stage. And in Micah 6, we're going to start at verse 6, and this is our, our final passage for this morning. What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high and offer offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? And the pagan nations did that. Now, with that context, God will state to the prophet Isaiah, I mean, of prophet Micah, what he wants. He says, I don't want this. And this really is moving from what we would call uh, uh, just a religious performance to a personal relationship with Christ. And what he's saying, this is not the way to salvation. This is what happens once you come. In the Old Testament, it would be faith in Jehovah God. In the New Testament, it's faith in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. Then you have the power by the Holy Spirit to live out these verses. He said, this isn't the way to get your way to heaven. This is what you do once you have your place reserved in heaven. And it, we would say that those two verses, six and seven, are kind of hypocrisy. People are saying, I can do this and earn my way. And I, you, you look today, there's kind of hypocrisy every place. But as someone, this is because someone who's going to church kind of to make business deals. Well, it's good to go to church, but it's, that's not why you go to church. And so he, he's saying this is the hypocrisy in verse 6 and 7, but this is the true spirit-filled life in verse 8. Now we're going to read that verse and then just kind of look at the phrases in detail. Uh, chapter 6, verse 8, he says, No, he answers him, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. This is what he requires of you, and this is it, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And he's saying, this is, this is what you do once you acknowledge God. And note what he says there, first of all, verse 8, No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. And everything God has always stated is perfectly good. And I, one of the things I love about Christianity, if you study every other world religion, it is men and women trying to get God's attention. And you, you see some of the horrible things that people do in, quote, a religion. And Christianity is the exact opposite because the whole picture of all the New Testament is God is seeking us. And that is a humbling thought that we should just thank God for every single day. And you think about it. What were the first words God spoke after sin? Adam, where are you? I'm seeking you. And he said to Noah, build an ark. And to Abraham, go forth from your country. He spoke to Joseph in dreams. And Moses received the first written words, the Ten Commandments. And then the prophet. And we have Micah here. God spoke to him and he speaks to us thousands of years later. And then he says, what is good? And that's why I selected that, that bulletin cover. Because God is saying, I take you from your chains and your bondage to sin and self. I give you life and freedom. Because what? It is good. And, and in verse 8, he says, and what does the Lord require of you? 
And I remember I called on a, a oh gosh, this has been 25 years ago, on a family, kind of a cold call. And, and the, the irony was they were a military family, and they go, well, we're here and we're retired. And, and it came in the conversation, he said, no one's going to be telling us what to do. I go, you've got to be kidding. You would think if anybody should know that, it should be a military person. But what, you grow up, and what, as you're about two or three, you learn the words no, you know, bad, spank. You know, you, why? Rules, there's regulations. But then you turn 16, and boy, how I'm a grown up. No one's going to tell me what to do. Oh, yeah? Every time you stop at a stop sign, stop at a red light, someone is telling you what to do. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to be punished. And, you know, then you get up in age and jobs and all that, and they're telling you you've got to pay this much tax, things we don't want to do, but we do. And the Lord said, this is what I require of you. But the requirements are wonderful. And he says, it's our relationship with you and others. I, I, this just came to me really this morning. The Ten Commandments, the first four, are our relationship with God. No idols, don't take my name in vain, remember the Sabbath. The last six are our relationship one with another. Don't steal. You know, don't, you, know, you know what they are. And this is what he's saying. And this is our relationship with others. He says, do what is right. And let me really use that word justice. And I'm not degrading our New Living Translation here. But if you look at most translations, they choose the word justice, probably because it's more, we understand a little bit more of how that comes about. And is justice a byword in our culture right now? Absolutely. And it kind of needs to be, I think, as well. And so we look at this statement, and he says, and do what is right, or, or do justice. And some, this little cartoon of two turtles, and one said to the other, sometime I'd like to ask God why he allows all this poverty, famine, and injustice when he could do something about it. And the other turtle said to him, I'm afraid God asks, might ask me the same question. Why? Because we are plagued with injustice, and it breaks our heart. And we get mad at times, and sometimes we should uh, get mad. And God has been concerned with justice. And probably one of the most famous misquoted verses in the Old Testament is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And people say that in the context of, I want to get even and get some revenge. Eye for an eye, tooth. It's exactly the opposite. In the, the time when that was penned, there was unlimited revenge in the Arab and Jewish world. In other words, if I went out and beat your brother up, you'd come and kill three of my brothers. It was just, what, you did something to me, and he said, no, no, no. Let the punishment fit the crime, justice. How would you feel if you got a parking ticket and you got 40 years in prison, solitary confinement? You'd say, whoo, that's a little harsh. Why? Because the punishment doesn't fit the crime. And so here, God is setting again the standard of justice. And we, as, you know, it's amazing, but the church has always been at the forefront of justice. You look at the child labor laws, and this is, I know some countries still have this, and it's heartbreaking, but they said, no, you, you can't have children in these factories working in these dangerous con conditions, and it's the church Christians. And you look at the story of William Wilberforce. You know, he worked tirelessly for decades and finally had slavery abolished in the British Empire. And Christians in the United States did the same for that horrible injustice. And you look at the church, Christians fought for the rights in mental hospitals and for humane treatment in prisons. And we have always been at the forefront of fighting for justice, and we need to do that. But sometimes it's kind of tough to know, you know it's how, to, how to do that. But the Lord will guide us. And he talks about this injustice, and we need to be those who love justice. And look at God's heart. The two cross-references on our outline, the first from, from uh, Zechariah 7, the Lord of hosts said, dispense true justice. And then from Psalm 37, for the Lord loves justice. <clears throat> and uh, we just need to be those who love justice. Um, and that verse that says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And someone made this statement, the rain falls on the just and the unjust uh, basically because the unjust just stole the just umbrella is what he said about this. But that's, well, that was funnier when I read that earlier this week. But anyway, we're, we're all good. But uh, someone said we should never expect justice in this world, but we should never cease to give it. And sometimes we're not going to get justice till we go through that pearly gate on the gates of, of heaven, uh, on the streets of gold. But we always need to fight for justice. And then the next one 
in Micah 6, verse 8, to love mercy. And another word that could be translated as kindness, maybe a, a word we use more often. And really the Hebrew word there is hesed, and it means loyal love, which is a, a phrase we don't use, we just don't use that at all. But it's, it's a word that is just so rich with meaning, whether it's mercy or kindness. And uh, years ago, I read a series. He was, is a Quaker pastor, which doesn't come across my desk very often. But he wrote these little kind of homey tales uh, about life in harmony. And he writes about the church and things. And he wrote about the church he was pastoring as a Quaker pastor. And he said the previous pastor set a world's record, probably in all of Quakerdom, he served for 27 consecutive years in that church. He, and he said the thing was he wasn't a good preacher. And he said he probably preached, preached over 14,000 messages and no one remembers a one of them. But he said the thing that made him a good pastor is he was kind. And I thought, you know, isn't that true? I remember a statement this one. This guy said when I was young, I used to admire fame and money and wealth and power. But he says now that I'm older, I, I admire kindness. And kindness, does our nation in circles, wherever we are, need a little bit of kindness? Oh, goodness, it needs a lot of kindness. Is that hard to do? Well, sometimes it is because we don't feel like being kind. But we need to go that extra mile and be one to love mercy, to love that, that kindness. And I've been saved a, a little, you'll be getting them too, a little promo from Salvation Army, you know, kind of one of the fundraisers. I love the Salvation Army. And they said, the best part of a person's life is not fame, wealth, or ability. The best part of a good person's life is the little acts of kindness and love given to others. I thought, how true, how true, how true. Uh, I have a story about it. It's a conversation between the president of Yale and the president of Ohio State. And the president of Yale said to the president of Ohio State, he said, always be kind to your A and B students because they'll come back and be good professors for you. And then he said, always be kind to your C students because someday they'll come back and build $20 million buildings for you. <laughs> and I go, you know, there might be a lot of truth to that. You know, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates never graduated from college, but, you know. Uh, and we look at that, what is its kindness. And our cross-references from God's word speak of that, Proverbs 19. What is desirable in a man is his, what? His kindness. Ladies as well. We see that in Proverbs 31. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. And then lastly, we see this is our relationship with God on a, a closer basis. And to walk uh, humbly with your God. And what does it mean to walk with God? It just means to have him at the center of our day as we begin it to bring him into every set. What would God want me to do here? What would God want me to say? And to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And that word humility is so often misunderstood in our culture. It is not a word that a lot of men, especially unbelievers, want to be called, oh, he's such a humble man. Oh, you got to be kidding. Because we think it's a doormat. But it's exactly the opposite. It's not someone walking on us. It's us from a position of strength taking a lower position because we love God and we care about these people. And <clears throat> we see uh, humility from uh, all portions of scripture, the, the men and women that walked with God in this relationship. And look down at our, our last um, uh, cross-reference that I chose this specifically, because who kind of had an issue with pride of the 12 disciples at times? Eh, it might have been Peter, okay? You know, a little bit too self-assured at times. But at the end of his life, as he wrote to the church, he said, clothe yourself with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. I was thinking about, you know, closing story example, and, and nothing really came up, and the Lord just brought this to my mind, and this is years and years ago. I had the privilege of hearing uh, Mr. T speak, and y'all, Mr. T from the 18 and all and doing whatever. But at this time, it was a very vulnerable spot in his life. He was recovering from uh, cancer treatments. Uh, he was as bald as I am, and uh, he the muscles were all gone. Uh, he lost a lot of weight, and uh, he gave a speech. To, it was kind of I was kind of the out person professionals. And uh, 
It was absolutely the worst technical speech I've ever heard in my life. Uh, if he'd have been in ninth grade speech class, he'd have got an F. He'd probably say, you need to repeat that. And what he was doing, he'd stand by podium like this, and he had notes. He had like 20 pages of notes. And he would fumble through them, and he'd go, okay, I want, okay, I want to talk about this for a minute. And he'd talk, and he'd talk, and then he'd go, okay, okay, I'm going to do this. And uh, there was no continuity, nothing. But you know what came through? I still remember he said, you know, I just love going down to the Salvation Army and playing with the kids. And here's a guy with fame, and I'm sure he's probably wealthy and all that, but he, he just came through as so humble, I still remember his speech because of the heart behind it, not the technicality of it. And I thought, Lord, that's in all of our reach. We can be humble, we can walk with God, we can love justice, we can want to be kind and merciful. That's within all of our reach. That's why I've chosen this as my life verse, and I, I, I will fully admit that I can't do it on myself, none of us can, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live that out. And we look at this little book of Micah. He is in the Christmas story. His prophecy is fulfilled. We celebrate it every Christmas. We look at his words are on that magnificent statue. The irony of that is that statue was given to us by the Russians or to the UN. And I thought, maybe they need to go back and read those words. But, you know, mark the UN and here a president had that read at his inauguration, and this little verse is in, in book has just stood the test of time. Father God, as I, we just come to the end of this book, it truly is a great book that would predict the, the birthplace of Jesus, and we thank you for the fulfillment that just brought um, uh, Jesus into this world to give us eternal life. We thank you for this prediction that speaks of the future of beating swords into plowshares, and we know that the best intended men and women can never, ever bring that about. But when Jesus returns, he can bring that. And Father, thank you for that little uh, descriptive verse that tells us how to walk with you and, and please you and how to relate to our fellow men and women, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, thank you that you are just that great God who speaks these words and they have spoken to the the folks in the time of, uh, of Micah, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, and they speak to our hearts today. And we just humble ourselves before you as we begin this new week. We want to walk with you. We want to love justice and kindness and mercy and, and just be in touch with you moment by moment by moment. And we pray that you'd help us to do this as we depend on the Holy Spirit, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.